The following is a transcribed interview between Clifford E. Carnicum and Gwen Scott, naturopathic doctor and former CNN broadcaster, recorded in February of 2004. Question. When did you become aware? When did you find out? How did you find out about the existence of these operations and whether they are real or not? Response. Well, it's interesting, because I realized that if I had been any place else on the planet, I might not have noticed. And so I am wondering how I ended up in the catbird seat to actually observe this operation. Operations. As you know, I live in a very rural area, and when I first moved here, the air was pristine. We had deep, deep blue azure skies, thousands of stars literally at night probably one of the least polluted air supplies in this United States because New Mexico is a very rural state. Very few people, very little industry. It's one of the things that drew me here. So here I was sitting, reading in front of a five foot by five foot bay window one day, and I see these jets. I assume they're jets. They're high and they're going fast and they're not leaving the little inch, two inch things that I'm used to seeing. They're leaving those huge plumes through the sky that spread out. And by three or four in the afternoon, it's foggy. It's so thick I can't see the mountain range. I can't see anything. And it's been continuous and ongoing ever since. To the degree now that the skies are so degraded that we never see deep blue skies anymore. Stars at night are hard to find. Everybody is getting accustomed to the pale blue, often white skies that we live with but I see them going over, and I've taken hundreds of photographs showing this is not your normal contrail that should dissipate. Question. You notice a distinct change then from the 1990 era? Response. Distinct is not the word. Dramatic, devastating, you can pick out any adjective you want. It is dramatically changed, the atmosphere. Dramatically, yes, extremely distinct question. You live on Native American Indian land here. What is the sense of and the reaction of the Native American community to what is occurring? Well, it's interesting. I figured if anybody would pick up on it, it would be the Native Americans. And so I immediately went to friends of mine in the community and said, have you guys noticed? And they are like, oh yes, we know absolutely what is going on. In fact, all 13 of the Pueblo governors had a meeting in secret to discuss it, what they would do, would they come out and protest it openly, what would they do? And after this meeting they determined the following things. No, they would not, that it was just another dumb thing the white guy was doing, and at that point I don't think they understood the true significance. But now I think they do, but more importantly that people wouldn't believe them or if they did believe them, would think it was only happening in this very confined space, and it really didn't affect them, and they were concerned for the gaming that people wouldn't come to the casinos and things because they would think that just this area was experiencing it. So they voted unanimously to not say anything. Question. So even the Native American community did not show the level of independence or the level of assertiveness to make this an issue? response. It was heartbreaking to me. But they're a little more philosophical, too. One of the medicine people that's a friend said to me, you know, this has been prophesied. We call it the death winds. We always thought that it would be nuclear fallout. But maybe this is the death winds. They have a very skeptical view, anyway, of what the white man's intentions are. Comment. And with good cause. Response and with good cause, and with history behind it. So, and they've also lost every battle, basically, they have fought that way. But I think as more and more of them get sick, and they are, there is maybe a wider awakening that this is really, really serious. Question. You have a background in the world of journalism, and specifically broadcast journalism. Can you talk a little bit about that background? and also the relationship of the media to what is occurring, what has failed, what has worked, any efforts that you have made to motivate the media to involve themselves in this, to cover this issue. Response. 
Yes, well, you and I are friends now, so you know that I was in broadcasting for 30 years. I worked for all three affiliated networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and many of the larger markets, and I culminated my career as an anchor at CNN and Headline News. So the medicine part of me was kind of going along as my passion, and so I made my living and had my career as a broadcaster, and any free time I had was spent studying the medicine, because that was where my true heart lay. So I have over the years a lot of really good contacts in some pretty high places in the media, but I would imagine pretty much everybody watching this will know there has been dramatic changes in the media. Who owns the media? The quality of human now being attracted into the media. In other words, why are they there? When I started, it was mostly all print folk, and they kind of had to tell us, you know, come on, clean up your act. This is visual. But people were coming from the old school of journalistic, afflict the comfortable, and comfort the afflicted. And you are the watchdog, and you go for that story, and you never accept the official version, and on and on and on. Most of the media and information we get now is owned by only three companies. When they deregulated, the FCC deregulated, they allowed these huge, like AOL, Time Warner to gobble up. So you've got these large entities controlling all the information, whether it's film, radio, okay. So the complexion has changed, and I would say the kind of person drawn into it when it became a place where you could make a really good living and people would go, oh, I know you, you're so-and-so, it drew people with different agendas. So you don't necessarily have the hardcore, old-fashioned, get the story. I don't care if my hair is a mess. I don't care if I'm dripping wet. There's a few out there still, but for the most part. So that's that. And yes, when this started, I called in every chip I ever had. I called a very good buddy at CNN, who really assigned most of the stories. He was very high, very interested. I sent him your website, a lot of your information. He was high, high, yay, yay, shut down. And I never did get an explanation. As you well know, I contacted some of our local media people. The main anchor on the local station wanted to do a story, we thought, and we shot a lot of video of the activity. In those days, it was very obvious. Now it's a little harder. You don't have the mornings where you have the deep blue sky, and then the afternoon. You get the pale blue-white sky if you're lucky. And as you well know, that story never aired. Comment. I would consider that a fairly serious, dedicated effort by a media person, and yet we saw nothing come of it. Response. Nothing came of it. Exactly. As you well know, the USA Today, which is an international publication, did a story on it, but it was obviously with an agenda, basically poking fun at those goofy, goofy people who saw those things. I believe there was one or two credible people interviewed, but for the most part, the reporter started out with an agenda to sort of mock, make fun of those people who were seeing things in the sky. And if I had a dime for everybody else that they called, wrote, or begged, I could at least buy an ice cream cone. To no avail. Just hitting a wall. Comment. And this was with all your connections. Response. This is with years of connections. It's unprecedented in my life. And I cannot name another story. People point to Watergate as this big watershed cover-up. I find that laughable. This, in my opinion, is the biggest story. And I approached many of my colleagues this way. This is the biggest story in recorded human history. You have an entire planet now covered with whatever by whoever, and nobody's even acknowledging it. What the heck is going on, and how come we don't know? Question. That's the question. What could explain that level of refusal? Response. A few things, okay. A few things, to be fair. Fear. I saw that. Fear. Because the folks that get it know who's doing it, and they're afraid. Okay? They know it's something bigger than them. They know all the possibilities of who is able to put planes in the sky. That many, every day, 24-7. It doesn't take a nuclear physicist to figure out that it's not the guy around the corner. This is big. 
comment. So even the journalist has that threshold that they're unwilling to cross. Response, oh yeah, afraid. And the few that are left who do catch on to it and say, wow, I want to do this story like we were just discussing. They hit a wall somewhere, and I'm never told where it is. I don't know if it's the news director. I don't know if it's the station manager. I don't know who. But they hit that brick wall, and it goes away. Mm-hmm.